Hello again, it's Mr. Kennedy with week two of our lectures. And this is a lecture, there's only a couple of slides, but there's a lot of talking, so make sure you do listen to it and make sure that you take notes if you need to. And this one is called Western European Expansion and the Ottoman Habsburg Struggle. Uh, we're going to talk about the Crusades, we're going to talk about the Ottoman Empire, and we're also going to talk about the Habsburgs, who are one of the most important families in European history. All right, Christian expansion. Um, this is going to be what happens after the Crusades are going on. Crusades start in the 1090s, and they go all the way up until the 1200s. And there's this period of relative peace between Christian kingdoms and the Muslim world, but that changes with the Reconquista that happens on the Iberian Peninsula. Now, if you're not sure where the Iberian Peninsula is, that's a fancy term for what is today Spain, Portugal, and Andorra. Now, there's a series of battles that go from 718 until about 1492, that pitted the Moors, who were Spanish Muslims, versus the Christians. And this was an attempt to restore what was known as the old Visigoth Kingdom. If you've had World History One, or if you've ever studied Rome, you may have heard of a group of people called the Visigoths. And the idea was to remove Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula. And this was finally accomplished in 1469, with the marriage of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And then finally in 1492, Spain under Ferdinand and Isabella are going to conquer the, the, uh, the island of Granada. Not island, the city of Granada, sorry. And then there's going to be the reconquering of cities in both Portugal and Spain. As a result of all of this reconquista, Portugal is going to be looking for a way to bypass Muslim traders in the Middle East so that they can deal directly with West Africans and deal directly with India. In Spain, the resumption of this reconquista is going to have the effects of combining the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, Catalonia into a united Spain. So that's where today's United Spain comes from. It's the, the combination of the kingdom of Castile and the kingdom of Aragon, Catalonia. Once that union occurs, there's a lots of reforming that happens. They reform the, their education system, they reform religion, military, you name it. And all of those reforms that happen in Spain increase the power of the monarchy and Spain is going to become one of the most powerful countries in Europe, at least for a little while. Another thing that happens around 1492 is that the Jewish population of the Iberian Peninsula is forced to convert to Christianity or to leave. Um, in 1492 that starts in Spain and then in 1497 that happens in Portugal. Once the Jews are either converted or forced to leave, forced conversions are extended to Muslims as well. And Spain and Portugal, so, they go so far as to burn non-Christian books and they forcibly turn mosques into churches. European exploration is going to be another result of this Christian expansion. Um, by the time we get into the early 1500s, late 1400s, there are several European countries that have strong national governments. England, France, Spain, Portugal, even Russia. And these strong national governments are going to allow those countries to be able to afford and spend money to explore. Another reason this exploration is going to happen is that there's a scarcity of items. Because of the Reconquista and because Europeans and the Muslim world are having this renewed fighting, 
items that come from Asia still have to be brought over to Europe, but they can't go through the Middle East anymore. We also have new inventions. There's the sand glass or the hourglass. There's the astrolabe and the uh, compass. And all these items are going to allow sailors to be able to pinpoint their locations on maps and be able to figure out how they got from point A to point B as well as how they can get back. In capital letters there you see it says not because of population. European exploration to the New World had absolutely nothing to do with population and the reason for that has to do with a pandemic. In the 1300s and in the 1400s the Black Death hits Europe and somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of everybody in Europe dies. There's plenty of space available. So just remember European exploration has nothing to do with too many people. Before you know it, the Portuguese are exploring the coast of Africa. They make it all the way to India. Vasco da Gama is the first one to sail all the way to India and do business from Portugal. And the Portuguese are going to gain control of all the gold trade coming in and out of Europe and the slave trade coming in and out of Europe as well. And even though a lot of people don't know where Portugal is today, at one point in time, Portugal was the absolute most powerful country in the world. A Portuguese noble named Prince Henry is going to take a lot of the new inventions of the time period and put them into practice and into actual use. And he opens up the school of navigation that teaches all of the major explorers of the time period how to actually sail on this new ship type known as a caravel. Um, you may have never heard the word caravel before, but you have seen it. If you imagine what Christopher Columbus's ships look like, the Nina the, and the Santa Maria and the Pinta, um, they've got the, the three masts, the three sets of sails, kind of like a pirate ship, that's what a caravel was. And Prince Henry and his school of navigation is going to teach people how to use that new type of ship. Now you might ask, why is that new type of ship so important? That ship could sail across the ocean with 10 people as opposed to the hundreds of people that the rowboats used to need. Spanish at the same time that this is all going on, they're going to hire Christopher Columbus, who is actually an Italian, to sail across the ocean and try to find a shortcut to India and a shortcut to China. And he actually ends up in the Caribbean and lands in the Bahamas. All right, the Ottoman Empire, changing focus just for a moment here. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is established by a Turkish warlord named Osman in the early 1300s. And its rise is directly related to the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Now, who are the Byzantines? You might, maybe you never had World History I before and you're like, who are the Byzantines? Well, there's a long story there that I'm gonna to try to make really short. Uh, in the year 330, the Roman Empire got so big that it split into the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire was focused around Rome, and the Eastern Roman Empire was focused around the city of Constantinople. The original name of Constantinople was Byzantium, and that's where the term Byzantine Empire comes from. Now the Byzantine Empire, with its capital at Constantinople, they think that they're the true successors to Rome. They were once part of the Roman Empire. Even after the fall of Rome in 476, the Byzantine Empire is strong. Well, by the time we get to the 1300s, there's this one lord, warlord named Osman who takes over the province of Bithynia and he declares himself an independent ruler. He takes over part of the Byzantine Empire, declares himself independent from the Byzantine Empire, and he's very successful. He and his successors will begin conquering provinces in what is modern-day Turkey 
And the Byzantines can't do anything about it because by the 1300s, they're very weak. They're just a shell of their former selves. By 1354, Osman and the Ottoman Turks, they've conquered land, land up to 100 miles away from Constantinople. At its largest, the Ottoman Empire is going to eventually stretch all along northern Africa, all the way up into Europe, into Hungary. And it's done mostly through the use of gunpowder. And the Ottoman Empire expands rapidly between 1290 and 1325 because they have access and use of gunpowder, which is something that Europe and the Byzantine Empire didn't have. Another thing that the Ottoman Empire has is something called a Janissary. The Janissaries are used to maintain control of this new empire. And the Janissaries, they're specially trained soldiers that work exclusively for the Sultan or the warlord, the leader of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Janissaries, they're young Christian boys who are taken from their families and put into Muslim families by force. Uh, they are taught Muslim lifestyle. They are taught to speak uh, Turkish. They are forcibly converted to Islam, and then they become soldiers for the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, it attacks Constantinople which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, on April 6th, 1453. Constantinople falls on May 29th, 1453, and that is the end of the Byzantine Empire. And the warlord, the Sultan, who defeats Constantinople is named Mehmet II. Mehmet II bombarded the wall of Constantinople with cannons. The walls fell apart. And then the Ottomans are able to storm the castle and kill the final Byzantine Empire emperor. And then they claim the city, they claim everything in it. The main church of, of Constantinople called the Hagia Sophia becomes a mosque. A new patriarch or leader of the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church is named. And the Mehmet II is going to allow all religions to practice as long as they pay their taxes. When we get to the Sultan named Suleiman, the Sultan Suleiman is going to build the Topkapi Palace. And that becomes the symbol of power for the Ottoman Empire. And the Topkapi Palace is still available today. You can go there today to uh, what is now Istanbul and you can tour it. But Suleiman, he's very famous because he uses the civil service to increase and expand his power. He uses the civil service to increase and expand the size of the military, the bureaucracy, and Suleiman is going to create this highly centralized state. And those Janissaries I mentioned, they are key to it. Um, Suleiman, he trains the Janissaries to be engineers, artisans, as well as soldiers. And they are paid by the emperor or the sultan, and they work only for the sultan. And they are a special class of Ottoman citizens that run the bureaucracy. The Janissary Corps, by the way, they start in the late 1200s, early 1300s, and they exist all the way up until the 1800s. So they're around for a long time. And by the way, the, to the Topkapi Palace. Uh, 10 mosques, 14 bathhouses, 2 hospitals, 2,000 women live there, and 4,000 horses. Another person we got to talk about is the person who I have on this picture right here. And that is a guy named Vlad Tepes or Dracula. Yes, Dracula was a real person. His actual name was Vlad the Impaler. Now, Vlad the Impaler, he lived in a place called Wallachia. And if you haven't heard of Wallachia, that's okay. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, today, we know it better as Transylvania. 
He was the son of a guy named Vlad II Dracul, which is where the name Dracula comes from. And Vlad II made a deal with the Ottomans to regain his throne after a group of nobles overthrows him. In exchange for help, he had to give two of his sons over to the Ottomans as hostages. And Vlad III Tepes was one of the two sons. In 1447, Vlad II is assassinated. The Ottomans put Vlad III on the throne of Wallachia, thinking that they'd be able to control him. Well, Vlad III rebels. He wants to take both Hungary and Wallachia for himself, kick out the Ottomans. And in 1456, Vlad III, he does conquer Wallachia. He begins to reform the kingdom. He gets rid of the nobles who killed his dad. And he destroys whole villages doing this. Um, estimates are he has somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 victims. In 1462, Mehmed II invades Wallachia, hoping to defeat Vlad III. Uh, and he's met by 20,000 corpses who are impaled on the side of the road. And Mehmed II thinks very carefully about his invasion. In 1476, Vlad III defeats Mehmed II. He becomes the king of both Hungary and Wallachia, but unfortunately he's killed in battle either later in 1476 or early in 1477. Today, Vlad is known A, as the origin of the vampire myth, and B, as a hero in Romania because he threw out the Ottoman Turks and gave Romania and Wallachia and Transylvania their independence from the Ottomans. Two other empires to mention real quick. Oops. The Safavid Empire, it's established in the late 1400s by a group of Persians and it's in what is today modern-day Iraq and Iran. Uh, they controlled much of the Silk Road trade route and they ruled through a hereditary class of warriors known as the Kitzelbash. The Kitzelbosch were very similar to the Janissaries of the Ottomans. So you can kind of think of them as contemporaries to do kind of the same thing. And the leaders of the Safavid Empire, they were Shiite Muslims and they considered everybody else to be inferior. There are two groups of Muslims that are mainstream. There's the Shiite and the Sunni. The Sunni Muslims made up slightly more than half of the population, but because the leaders were all Shiite, uh, the Sunnis were persecuted and pushed out of control. And this power struggle between the Shiite and the Sunnis caused a lot of the instability that we have today in Iraq and Iran and other places in the Middle East. Think of like ISIS and the Taliban. Those are partially results of this Safavid empire. Because of this instability, European countries tried to take control of the Safavid empire. And that's where the idea of jihad comes into uh, parts of Muslim culture. Um, it was a way to protect their culture and is yet another reason why there's fighting in the Middle East today. The most famous of the Safavid leaders is Shah Abbas. He ruled from 1588 to 1629. And he required everybody to practice a version of Shiite uh, Islam. And if you weren't Shiite, you just weren't worth his time. He would ignore you or kill you or just not help you. Abbas was very paranoid. He had any member of his own family blinded or killed that he didn't personally trust. And that included one of his sons, the Crown Prince Mohammed uh, Mirza. His name's not important, but just so you know that he actually murdered his own son. Now, in the late 1500s, the Safavids attempt to become friends with several European kingdoms. This doesn't work out because of the difference of religions. Uh, Abbas basically hoped that a mutual hatred of the Ottoman Turks would allow him to become friends with Europe. But the Europeans demanded that he become Christian first, and he said, no, thank you. Uh, during the 1600s, there's groups of people on the fringes of the kingdom that begin to revolt. And outsiders from Russia, Mongolia, and India begin to put pressure on the Safavid Empire. And it becomes difficult for the Safavid, Safavids to maintain control of their borders. And then eventually, even the Ottomans begin to invade and they conquer what is today Iraq. And that left the only 
remaining Safavid Empire territory as what is today Iran. After that, we have the Mughals. The Mughal Empire, those are empires that are created in northern India when these Muslim leaders begin to uh, rule traditionally Hindu kingdoms. Uh, the leaders of these Mughal, Mughal uh, empires are generally extremely wealthy, and that's because they very often control the trade routes and they control the trading supplies. There are several strong and well-educated leaders, uh, but they fall apart because of civil war. And I'm going to talk more about the Mughal Empire in the future, so I don't want to go too far into it. But just know that uh, in 1658, there is a civil war. Uh, this leader named Aurangzeb defeats his father in battle and then completely prohibits Hinduism, which makes a big issue. From there, we have the Habsburgs. Uh, the Habsburgs, we'll talk about them a couple more times. Uh, they are originally a power family that married into several different royal families. Uh, they themselves eventually become royalty, and the Habsburg dynasty is going to reign over Spain, parts of Italy, parts of Germany, Austria, you name it. Uh, some of the Habsburgs even become emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. When we get to the mid-1550s, one of the Habsburg emperors, his name is Charles V, he splits his empire into east and west. Uh, he is, his son, Philip II, gets control of Spain, uh, the Netherlands, all the territory in the Americas, and Naples, which is today part of Italy. His brother, Ferdinand I, gets control of Austria, Bohemia, which is today the Czech Republic, Hungary, and then the Ottoman, or the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, Charles, his hope is that his brother and his son will help each other, but that doesn't really go to plan. Uh, Philip II fears the Ottoman Empire and the Muslims, and Philip II's fear of the Ottoman Empire and of Mus Muslims is going to renew the Inquisition and start a whole new wave of forced conversion to Catholicism. And all Muslim residents are going to be expelled from Spain and the Eastern Habsburg Empire in 1609. And because of this, the Ottomans and the Habsburgs become mortal enemies. In North Africa, the two dynasties fight for control of Morocco, Portugal, and the North African coast. While in the East, the two sides fight for control of Austria, Bohemia, Hungary, and parts of the former Byzantine Emperor. So it's the Ottomans and the Habsburgs are the two big protagonists, antagonists during the time. Eventually, France is going to side with the Ottomans, which shocks the Habsburgs. And it, the reason France sides with the Ottomans is because they saw it as a way to gain territory and gain power despite the difference in religion. Eventually, the Habsburg Empire will become the largest in Europe until it starts this slow march to its death in the mid-1700s. Uh, the Ottomans basically grow tired of fighting the Habsburgs, and they turn their attention to conquering the Safavids. And in the end, by 1580 or so, the Ottomans and the Habsburgs declare peace with each other. And the Habsburgs in the west in Spain eventually die out, but the Habsburgs in the east go on to create the Austrian Empire and then the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and they're going to stay in power until after World War I. Alright, a lot of stuff in this video, a lot of information that I had given to you. Make sure you watch it a couple of times to, to get the information and process it. And if you have any questions about anything, just send me an email because this is a the Habsburgs fascinate me, just how powerful they were and really how lucky they were to come to power. Um, but that's it for today, 25 minutes. Any questions, comments, concerns, please email me, and I look forward to hearing from you. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.